is the great god Quay, the tale of Barada and the weak ways. This story is written by George Alec Effinger. Barada came from Clatawine originally, and at night he dreamed that he was still there, feeling the fresh wind of his homeworld on his face. Of course, in his dreams, his face wasn't yet deformed and scarred, and in his dreams, he wasn't the virtual prisoner and slave of the hut. At night, as he slept on his bunk, Barada was still young and hopeful, and filled with plans to leave Klatawin behind and find adventure on some more exciting planet in the vast empire. Then, morning would come, and Barada would awaken. He would blink a few times, the dream memories of his family and childhood home fading slowly from his thoughts. Klatawin, he'd think grimly. Adventure. He'd sit up and rub his face with his large, strong hands. He'd never see his home world again, he knew. He'd spend the rest of his life on this desert planet, caring for the hut's repulsive fleet. Barada shrugged. It was as good a life as any, and better than some. All he really lacked was liberty, and in the Empire, that was a fairly common situation. His needs were met, and as for his wants, he was free to dream about them as much as he liked. This morning, Barada's only concern was finding six rocker panel cotter pins for the AE-35 unit that helped keep the hut sail barge aloft. The shipment of parts that Barada had ordered weeks ago had never arrived. If he couldn't find the pins in the scrap heap, he'd have to make replacements the hard way in his shop. It was a bright clear day on the dune sea, the kind of weather that the hut preferred. Barada squinted in the fierce sunshine as he left the barracks building. He'd walked only a few yards before two armed weakway guards joined him, one on either side. I do something? Barada asked. What did I do? The grey-skinned Weequays didn't answer. Barada had never heard them speak. They just walked beside him, carrying their four spikes. He wasn't happy about their company. The hut sent you to get me? He asked. There was only silence from the Weequays. He turned in the direction of the scrap heap behind the hut's palace, and the Weequays followed. They were among the most mer merciless fighters in the hut's retinue. But if they'd wanted Barada dead, injured, or in irons, it would already have happened. The weak ways were as inscrutable as any species in the Empire. So for the time being, there was nothing for Barada to do but ignore them. Finally, he decided to pretend they weren't even there, and to go on with what he'd planned for the morning. The blazing summer sun and desert climate made the scrap heap an unpleasant destination. Barada could smell the stench long before he could see his goal. Garbage and trash of every kind had been piled up in a gigantic mound. The Klaswunen shook his head and frowned. He really didn't want to do it, but he waded hip deep into the rotting food and discarded machinery searching for a half dozen small metal parts. You guys want to help me out here? He said, shading his eyes with one hand. The weak ways only stared at him. Barada muttered a curse in his native language and went back to work. Five minutes later, the mechanic made his discovery. It wasn't the rocker panel cosser pins he had been looking for or any kind of useful machinery. It was just a dead body. Akbar's, Barada murmured, recognising the corpse. Akbar's, the captain of the hut sail barge. The weak ways glanced at each other and stepped closer. They still didn't say anything, but at least they had shown some interest. Together, they hauled Akbar's body out of the garbage and laid it on the ground. Barada grunted. No marks, he said. 
Whoever killed the guy didn't leave the marks on the body. He looked from one weak way to the other. Anzat. It's an Anzat killed him. Anzat don't leave marks. If the weak ways were impressed, they didn't show it. They squatted beside Akbuzz's body and examined it for a few minutes. Then they stood up and started to walk away. Barada followed. There's been a lot of dead bodies turning up, he said. The weak ways halted and faced him. One reached out and put his hand on Barada's chest. The other pointed back to the scrap heap. Sure, said the mechanic. None of my business. I get it. I guess I'll just go look for those pins now. Want me to do anything with our friend Akbuzz? He got no answer, of course. The weak ways shouldered their force pikes and marched off in step toward their own quarters. They stared straight ahead, not even changing expressions, until they'd arrived at a small building that housed the hut's weak way contingent. They went inside. There were more weak ways in the hut's employ, but they were away, attending to other matters. Alone now, said Weakway. We can talk, said the other Weakway. Weakways have no individual names. It never seems to cause them any difficulty, though. Trouble. Weakway nodded. He put his force pike down on his bunk. Too many dead. Even stupid Barada knows that. The Weakways paused, possibly in thought. We must have a meeting, said one finally. Agreed, said the other. The weak ways sat down at a plank table, across from each other. One put slips of paper and writing styluses between them. This was the first activity at any proper weak way meeting, the election of officers. There are two of us. One will be president, the other secretary-treasurer. Agreed. Each took a blank piece of paper and a stylus, marked his secret ballot and folded it in half. We will read them together. They unfolded the papers and counted the votes. There are two votes for Weakway for President, and two votes for Weakway for Secretary Treasurer. It is done, said the other. I am now President. You, Secretary, must record these proceedings for the future of you. The Weakway Secretary put a small electronic recording device on the table between them. Good. Now I ask, will we tell Jabba of this most recent murder? The secretary shook his head. No, we can't. Not until we find the killer. More time passed in silence. We must ask the god, said the weak way president. Ask the god, the other agreed. Neither was happy about the decision. The weak ways worshipped a variety of gods, most of whom represented natural forces and creatures on their homeworld. One of their chief gods was Quay. Wee Quay means follower of Quay, the god of the moon. Many Wee Quays kept in close personal contact with this god through a device which they called a Quay. This was a white sphere made of high impact plastic about 20 centimetres in diameter. The Quay could recognise speech and reply to simple questions. To the Wee Quays, the object looked like the moon of their home planet, and they believed a bit of their lunar god inhabited each Quay. They never quite understood that the Quays were manufactured cheaply by more imaginative species, and there was nothing at all supernatural about them. The Wee Quay president reverently moved the glistening Quay from its leather sack. Hear us, O great Gog Quay, he said. We come to you for guidance. Will you grant us, your true believers, a hearing? A few seconds passed. Then, a tiny mechanical voice said, It is decidedly so. The Wee Quays nodded to each other. Sometimes, the great Gog Quay was not in the mood to be interrogated, and he could stay recalcitrant for hours, even days at a time. With several of the hut servants dead, now including the barge captain, Akbars, the Wee Quays knew they needed immediate help. We, your true believers, praise you, O great Gog Quay, and thank you, 
Will you reveal to us the identity of the foul murderer of Barge Captain Akbaz? The Weequays held their breaths. They heard the whirring of the ventilation system in the barracks, but nothing else. Then, the mechanical voice piped. As I see it, yes. The god was in a cooperative mood today. Is the killer in this room? asked President Weequay. The secretary snarled fiercely at him. It is the necessary first question, explained the president. Concentrate and ask again, said the white quay. The president closed his eyes tightly and said, Is the killer in this room? Better not tell you now, said the god bull. You see, cried the president, it is you. The wee quay reached across the table and clutched his fellow's tunic. No, I swear, said the secretary, terror-stricken. The great god quay did not identify me. Ask him a third time. The president released the weak way, reluctantly, then looked down between them at the sphere of prophecy. We beseech you, O great god Quay, is the killer in this room? The answer came quickly. Very doubtful. Both weak ways relaxed. I am relieved, said the president. I did not wish to abandon you to the vengeance of Jabba. We still don't know who the murderer is, said the secretary. We must learn if there will be more victims. The president nodded slowly. He had begun to realise that their future well-being depended on investigating these crimes and presenting their suspicious employer with a neatly tied up solution. The heart had no patience at all with incompetence and guards who couldn't guard would soon find themselves on absolutely the wrong end of something's food chain. Will more of Jabba's entourage be killed? asked the president. A low-pitched grinding noise came from the quay on the table. The two wee quays looked at each other, then back down at the white sphere. It is certain, said the tinny voice. The secretary bent low over the device. Will I die? He asked quietly. Without a doubt, the Quay responded instantly. We Quay, said the President, you waste time. Of course you will die. All who live will die some day. Be silent and I will gather the information. O oh, great God Quay, what weapon are we looking for? Is it a blaster? Don't count on it, said the White Ball. A rifle of some sort then? My reply is no. The Weequay president tossed his braided top knot over his left shoulder. Is it any sort of projectile weapon? My reply is no. A knife then? Is the murderer's weapon a knife? The secretary pounded the table with a fist. There were no knife wounds on Akbar's, he said. A rope or silken cord? asked the president. The secretary looked even more impatient. No signs of strangulation. We would have seen them. The mystery was too complex for the limited weekway minds. All these deaths, said the president. The secretary's eyes opened wider. Different methods? Why? And who, said the president. He rubbed his chin for a few seconds, then put his hands flat on the table. On either side of the sacred quay. O oh, great god quay, you have told us there will be at least another death. Will it too happen by a different method? Outlook good, was all the device had to say. Not blaster, said the secretary thoughtfully. Not rifle, not knife, not rope. Is it a poison gas? My reply is no, said the great god quay. Is it an injection of deadly drugs? The quay made a sound like the grinding of teeth. Very doubtful. Is it tiny little off-world creatures that infest the body and kill the host horribly at a later date, giving the killer time to establish an alibi elsewhere? There was a long pause from the quay, as if it were digesting this strange possibility. My sources say no. Outside, the hot sun of Tatooine climbed higher in the sky. 
It was approaching noon. Barada was at work in his shop, overseeing the construction and installation of six new rocker panel cotter pins for the AE-35 unit. Word had come down from the hut himself that the sail barge would be setting forth later that day. With Akbar's now greeting his ancestors in his race's version of heaven, Barada assumed he himself would have to captain the huge craft. He'd done it before, when Akbar's had shown up for duty less than sober. Meanwhile, the Weequays laboured mightily to get some useful information from the Quay. It was simply a matter of asking the right questions. If the Weequays stumbled on the correct weapon, and then the true identity of the murderer, the great god Quay, would let them know they'd succeeded at last. However, time slipped by as they guessed one thing after another, from every kind of blunt object to a pile of straw near the scrap heap. Akbar's could have been smothered in the straw, the president insisted. It's possible. And you accuse me of wasting time, said the secretary scornfully. Oh, great gold quay, was the barge captain drowned in a bucket of water? Don't count on it. If nothing else, quay had more patience than the average primitive deity. Does the weapon begin with the letter A? asked the president. The other week, Wade glared furiously. Now we'll be here all afternoon. What a foolish way to... My reply is no, said the god ball. The letter B, asked the president. You're never going to learn anything that way, said the secretary. I call for new elections. It is decidedly so. Both week Wade stared at the white plastic sphere. The letter B, said the secretary... B for what, said the president. Blaster? No, we asked that. Banfa? Will the murderer kill the next victim with a banfa? There was tense silence in the barracks. Then the quay replied, Cannot predict now. The president took a deep breath and let it out again. Will the murderer kill the next victim with a banfa? This time, the quay didn't hesitate. My reply is no. The Weequays went on through the alphabet, trying every object and technique they could think of. At last, as three more armed Weequays entered the barracks, the secretary asked, Bomb? Is it a bomb? On the sail barge? Signs point to yes, said the mechanical voice. All five Weequays gasped. Oh, great god Quay said the president hoarsely. We, your true believers, thank you. We will use the gift of your prophecy to protect your servants, and we praise your wisdom and power. One of the newly arrived weakways came to the table. What does this mean? he demanded. Akbar's dead, said the secretary. Bomb aboard the sail barge, said the president. We must find it, said the third weakway. We must disarm it, said a fourth. We must punish who, asked the fifth. The secretary looked at the president. Does the murderer's name begin with the letter A, he said to the quay. The secretary didn't say anything. He just squeezed his eyes shut and rubbed his aching forehead. It was going to be a very long day. Barada wouldn't let his workmen quit for the midday meal until the AE-35 unit had been repaired and replaced in the sail barge. It wasn't a difficult job, but Barada was an extremely exacting supervisor. He had to be. If there were the smallest malfunction, if any mechanical breakdown interrupted the hut's pleasure cruise, Barada himself would be the next corpse to be found on the scrap heap. He didn't intend for that to happen. He checked the fittings and connections carefully, then slid the AE-35 hatch cover into place and slapped it closed. Good, he said. He wiped his perspiring brow with one hand. Anything else? Mal Hib, Barada's capable human assistant, glanced at a data pad in her hand. All the diagnostic tests turned up green, she said. The mechanic nodded. Nothing more we can do now, I guess. All right, let's take an hour for lunch. 
We'll check out the barge again later, before the hug gets here. Malhib frowned. She was recognised in the workshop for her skill with a welding torch. Although she was two feet shorter than Barada and compactly built, she was also a good ally in a brawl. Her fighting ability always surprised her opponents, once. More tests? she asked. Barada grunted. You haven't worked for the hut as long as I have. If I could make this crew do it, I'd be running diagnostics all day and all night. I've seen the hut execute a crewman because a shutter squeaked. Malhib shook her head and walked away. Barada heard a sound, turned, and saw a party of five Weequays enter the barge's hangar. He wasn't pleased. The Weequays approached him. One of them gestured towards the sail barge. You want to go aboard, said Barada. Why? You still trying to figure out who killed Akbuzz? The Weequay spokesman nodded. Not a chance, said Barada. We've got the barge all tuned up, and I don't want you leather-faced bullies wrecking it. A second Weequay held out a paper sack. Barada took it, opened it, and looked inside. Benays, he said surprised. Porcellus's Benays. Another Weequay nodded. All right, I guess, said the mechanic. You've got to do your job too. Just don't touch anything. The five Weequays formed up in single file and boarded the sail barge. Barada sat down stiffly on the concrete and took the first benet from the bag. The Weequays poked around the sail barge, not entirely sure what they were looking for. A bomb, of course, but what kind of bomb was it? How big? And where? There were a million places to hide one. The Weequay president carried the quay with him and murmured, Does the murderer's name begin with the letter V? Vader? Valerian? Ventai Paz? The quay began to stammer, Were? Yes, the Weequay prompted, Were? Oh, great god quay, what are you trying to tell us? The Weequay president wrapped the oracle ball with an astonishing lack of piety, Were? Wookie? Is that it? The Wookie is the assassin. I don't think that's possible, said the secretary. W said the Quay. We Quay? asked the president. It cannot be. A We Quay? Guilty of murder? W A third We Quay listened to the exchange. What is wrong here? he asked. I don't know, said the president. The great god Quay is having some trouble communicating. W Wifford, asked the secretary. Without a doubt, said the plastic ball at last. Ah, said the president. The mystery is solved. The Wifford planted the bomb on board. The five Weequays nodded, satisfied at last to know the truth. They stood in Jarba's privacy lounge, shifting their force spikes from one hand to the other. The president held the now silent quay. Of course, said the secretary slowly. There is a bomb, and we will also be on board when it detonates. We still must search for it. Search for it, cried one of the others. Yes, said the president. You four search the barge. I will consult the great god Quay. Four of the Weequays began a frantic hunt for the hidden explosive. They threw open cabinets, upset furniture, damaged the bulkheads looking for secret panels and compartments. Meanwhile, the president sat at a table with the prophecy sphere and said, Is the bomb under the purple cushion? Very doubtful. Is the bomb under the gold cushion? Don't count on it. Is the bomb hidden in the pile of silks? The president realised that he wasn't making very good progress, but he didn't know what else to do. He was a good, honest, forthright Weequay, but he had Weequay limitations, after all. An hour later, the hut's guests and servants began to arrive to prepare the sail barge for the day's excursion. Some of them gave the Weequays suspicious glances. But as the Weequays served as security guards on the barge, they were allowed to continue their search unhindered. Try to blend in, the president whispered to his fellows. They were still tearing the barge apart from stern to bow, but now they tried to seem casual and unworried. 
The truth was that as the minutes passed, it became ever more likely that the bomb would go off and blow them all into constituent atoms. Even the weak ways understood that. The order was given to cast off, and there had not yet been any evidence of the hidden threat. The party guests were enjoying themselves, eating the hut's food and drinking the hut's liquor, and generally making the search even more difficult. The weak way president found himself staring into the malevolent, free eyes of Reyes the Grand. The president turned back to the quay and asked, Is the bomb in the control cockpit? Maddeningly, the white ball said, Reply, Hazy. Try again. The weak way wanted to throw the device against the wall in frustration, but it would have attracted unwanted attention, and the great god Quay would probably have exacted some horrible punishment as well. The president watched the gold-coloured protocol droid in conversation with an R2 model that was serving drinks. Mr. President, a low voice murmured. The weak way turned. His four fellows stood nearby. One held something covered with a square of green satin. The item, whispered the president. The other four weak ways nodded. The president lifted a corner of the satin material and saw a thermal detonator. We must disarm it, secretly, silently. The band tootled its horrible music. The guests milled about, unaware of the danger in their midst. Meanwhile, the five weak ways formed a tight huddle and worked feverishly to dismantle the detonator. The proper tools were available on the sail barge, of course, but the problem was that two of the weak ways disagreed on the disarming technique. Pull that circuit patch now, said the secretary. You'll kill us all, said the president. Break the green and yellow connections, then pull the circuit patch. There is no green connection, insisted the secretary. There's a yellow one and a grey one. The problem is with your eyes, said the president. Hurry, said one of the others. It is my responsibility, said the president. He took the detonator and the tools. He broke first the green connector, then the yellow connector, and then yanked out the circuit patch. The weak ways said nothing. They hadn't realised that none of them had even breathed for nearly a minute. You could have blown us to bits, the secretary accused. You should have consulted the great god Quay before you acted. I forgot, said the president. Yet the bomb is dead, said one of the others. We are victorious, said another. A loud, clear voice came from beyond the bulkhead. Jabba, this is your last chance. Free us or die. The hut responded with something in its own language. What is happening? asked a weak way. The president turned around quickly. Panic and confusion were taking over the sail barge. A human slave girl was strangling the great Jabba with her own chains. There was the sound of shots being fired from outside. One of the weak ways opened a shutter to peer out and was grabbed and pulled from the vessel, thrown down to the desert floor below. Clutching his force pike, the president led the remaining weak ways toward what was now clearly a battle. He jabbed upward with the pike, leading the others on deck. The president arrived to see the black-clad human prisoner using a lightsaber to clear the deck of weak way guards and other defenders. Get the gun, the human cried to the slave girl. Point it at the deck. For the great god Quay, murmured the president softly. Then he advanced. At least they had disarmed the bomb, so the sail barge will be safe. Before he could attack, the human with the lightsaber put an arm around the slave girl, clutched a heavy rope and kicked the firing mechanism of the deck gun. Then he and the girl swung from the sail barge to a small repulsor skiff, hovering over the dreadful great pit of Carcoon, where the Sarlacc dwelt. The president watched them escape. Around him, the sail barge was burning and bursting into ruins. But unfortunately, weak ways do not have enough imagination to fear death either. The president calmly clung to a railing, as another tremendous explosion ripped the sail barge to pieces. The last thing he saw was the glorious sight of the white ball of the quay held into the air, the great god quay ascending to heaven.